Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Nall. Nice to have you with us today. From the University of Granada comes a study about coenzyme Q10 and how it can treat your mitochondrial diseases like colon cancer, thyroid carcinoma, Crohn's disease. Very important study. You have to remember, coenzyme Q10 is actually not a vitamin. It's a molecule essential for life that is synthesized in the cells of our organs and tissues, but we can also get it through our diet. The older you get, the less you have. Therefore, we end up with what we consider a normal slowing down. Systems slow down. Our metabolism slows down. That means that at the age of 40, if we ate the same amount of food we did at 20, we'd be gaining weight because we're not able to burn those calories as energy. But it also means our muscles are slowing down, our brain, our heart. As a result, we go through what we call normal aging. But it's not normal aging. In fact, just in the last 16 months, we have proven scientifically, for the first time ever, that we can reverse objective reverse, meaning not subjective. Oh, I feel better. Oh, I sleep less and have more energy. Or I don't wake up in the middle of the night. Those are subjective. I'm talking about objective criteria. We can actually slow down, repair damaged cells, stimulate new cell growth, new stem cells, and literally revitalize ourselves. And, and by the way, as soon as the Review Journal publishes the article, I'll be sharing it with the public and the protocols that allowed this to happen. It'll take a little bit of time to share all this with you, by the way, because it it took me a lifetime of studying anti-aging medicine. I was senior research fellow at the Institute of Applied Biology and director of their anti-aging medicine or division. So I've done a lot of studies, 44 clinical studies, over 145 experiments, but this was, this was what we can see. Now I'm going from here to another more advanced stage. Now, coenzyme Q10 is a very important part of that. And when you suddenly see someone start to have more energy, the cellular cells have more energy, the brain becomes almost revitalized, memory returns, inflammation is turned off, cognition is improved, reflexive time enhanced, more dynamic muscle use, starting to see your abs, even that V that appears on the stomach going from the hip bone down to the groin on both sides. That's when you're in shape. That's all doable. You just have to have the desire and will to say, yeah, I'd like to get back to being a younger person. Therefore, judge me by my chronological age, not my, my biological age, not my chronological age. So just one nutrient is one piece of this whole puzzle, coenzyme Q10. And the University of Granada demonstrated for the first time that a Q coenzyme Q10 supplement is capable of modulating hydrogen sulfide metabolism and one carbon metabolism. Little, I won't go into the science of this or the biochemistry, even though we have a lot of scientists and physicians, nurses who listen to the show and like the kind of more in-depth explanations. But a study led by a scientist has found that a supplement of coenzyme Q10, remember, it's essential for life, that is synthesized in the cells of our organs and tissues and is also acquired through the diet, could constitute a valuable complementary therapeutic option in the treatment of certain mitochondrial diseases, colorectal cancer, which orthodox medicine has not succeeded well in treating thyroid carcinoma and Crohn's disease. The two most well-known functions of coenzyme Q10 is its role in the process of generating useful energy for cells. In the most lay concept, think of throwing a log onto a burning fire, and it sustains it. If you get a soft wood, it burns fast. If you get a hard wood, hickory, cherry, um, ironwood, which is the hardest of all woods, walnut, and uh, oak, those are 
harder woods, thicker woods, you can put a few logs on, they'll burn all night. So you want something that sustains your energy. And that means it will slow down the natural aging process where you have a normal decline in your coenzyme Q10 levels. But that decline also contributes to what we consider normal aging, but it's not. It is clinical manifestations of the pathogenicity of aging, meaning you have, look, look at you've got a fork in a road. <clears throat> You're 20 years old. One fork says, let's be aware at a young age that every single choice I make will have an outcome sooner or later, but they're all cumulative. This right course, we're going to take this road, is more problematic, requires much more focus, discipline, sacrifice, <clears throat> and honesty. You have to be willing to deal with all the things you meet in life without trying to assume that they're something other than what they are. Just being honest. On the other course, it's different. This road, this path, everyone's on that path. It seems like no one's on the one path, a few people, and they're considered eccentric or odd. Why would you go through all that effort? We're going to watch television. We're going to be couch potatoes. We're going to eat whatever we want, as much as we want. We're going to overreact. And I, I came up with it relatively simple idea. It's not profound on any level, and I'm not claiming it is, but it is, I believe, it could allow us to be more insightful. So think of this for a moment. I just came up with this last night. Excess emotions will inevitably lead to excessively negative outcomes. Or you could say excessive emotions lead to dangerous outcomes. Either way, if we stopped and thought, what is the likelihood of being excessively emotional? Well, on that one road, you're simply honest. Whatever is, okay, why do I feel anger, rage, outrage, joy, happiness, optimism, pessimism, negativity, all these, this whole, uh, this whole cacophony of emotions, why do I feel it? Let me step back and take a look. Let me try to be a, a modern day emotional anthropologist. Let me ruminate through all this and see, can I find the progenitor, the beginning of something? Ah, now I know why I do A. But that means you're having to deconstruct all of the causal factors. Piece by piece, you look at each piece of the puzzle. And therefore, we think, now I know why I do that. So now that I know it, and I know that's not going to lead to a good outcome, how many times have you heard people start to argue, and one person gets louder than the other louder? Then they're screaming at each other. And they scream and scream and scream, not aware. Your blood pressure's rising. You are more likely to have a stroke or many stroke. You're more likely to have a heart attack. You're destroying your brain cells by the millions because cortisol is rushing. Is your flight or fight? It doesn't know why this argument is going on. It just knows that you're very, very excited. And so it's pumping everything it can into the system temporarily. That's killing cells. So what if you develop a pattern that the only way you can defend yourself is to scream, to yell, to get in someone's face and on on a normal way of living, rarely do we ever change our behavioral patterns. If we go into the shower in the morning and we suds up and we start washing maybe our groin, then our armpits, then our face, whatever part of the body we wash, almost every day you're going to wash the same way, same way. Brushing your teeth, same way. Talking on the phone even. Whether we let someone finish what they're saying or intercede because we need to stop what they're saying so we can let them know we have a, a point of view, right or wrong, is irrelevant. So in this path of life, there's two courses we take. One where you actually examine what's happening in the moment because you're mindful of the moment. You're mindful of the people around you. You're mindful of the words you share. Are they constructive or destructive? Am I sharing something for your own good? 
that's really a weaponized statement? Are you sorry that you're out of a relationship and now you want to poison the water for that person? Make them feel bad about being alive or who they are because we're no longer a part of that. And almost always what a person's doing when they're doing something for your own good is what they can't stand about themselves but are not willing to acknowledge they project upon other people. That's on the left-hand side. That's where you're going up this one path where you eat what you want, you say what you want, you do what you want, you lie when you want, you manipulate when you want, you connive, you use people's trust as you want. And then when there's a net beg- bad outcome, oh, okay, that goes back to what I just said. Excessive emotions, and that's a person living by excessive emotions, including fear, anger, jealousy, greed. It always leads to a destructive outcome. And so then you look at everything that a person eats and drinks, what they watch, who they vote for, what they will not participate in, what they excessively participate in, and then that gives you an idea of the outcome. So if you want to see your future, measure your restraints, because that's the restraint is what will determine your future. On the other path, it's going to be a lot harder more lonely, more challenging, but a far greater reward because you're not going to have the accumulation of things undone, unsaid, and unchanged. You're going to say it, do it, change it, challenge it, and grow from it. So now you're going to be the person on a plane not eating the chicken kiev, which is neither chicken, probably mystery meat, or it's not from kiev, that I can assure you. So, you're going to be the person that's going to have less disease, more happiness, be more authentic and honest, more free to be who you are without constantly feeling that you must maladapt other people's artificial needs of you. And then you get to the point where the next place that you both end up is one's got disease, the other doesn't. One looks 20 years older than the other and they're both the same age. One has a purpose and meaning to life and are honoring. The other is just going through formalized rituals, backing through life by being proud of what they didn't do and the risks they didn't take or the risks they take took that they shouldn't have, where the other is a completely different projection. Now you see what aging has, and now multiply that by 30 hours to 50 hours of discussion And then you know why I can't just superficially give you a a protocol. Well, Gary, do I just take B? No. No, you can take all the vitamins in the world. doesn't mean diddly squat if you haven't changed all the other more important components. So in time, I will share that in-depth analysis of the aging process. I just have to get through it through a few things. The major documentary done on it, so you can actually see it for yourself, real people in real time. You can see the whole thing. Unrehearsed people reversing diseases, reversing the skin aging, no more creepy skin, no more lost muscle mass, strength and endurance. A person that couldn't walk a mile walks 26 miles nonstop fast. Yeah, you're going to see it all. It's coming and coming probably in the next two months. But just one small piece, that's coenzyme Q10. Because if you want to help with all these different problems, it's a way of helping you. Now, also a way of helping people with Alzheimer's disease, and this is from the Nagar University in Bangladesh, is reishi mushrooms, R-E-I-S-H-I, reishi. They ameliorate non-spatial learning and memory deficits in this laboratory experiment. And it does this mainly by turning down the uh, different inflammatory markers and blocking some of the progression of the amyloid plaque being laid down in the brain. In either case, reishi mushrooms helps. And that was published in the peer-reviewed journal. And also, from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, published in Environmental Health Perspectives Journal, the ability of our skin to protect us from chemicals is something that we inherit. Some people are less well-protected 
which could imply an increased risk of being afflicted by skin diseases or cancer. A new study uh, from the Karolinska Institute has shown that the rate of uptake of common chemicals, meaning the things you use in cosmetics, from hairsprays to deodorants, from what's in a shampoo or a moisturizing cream, to even the chemicals in your environment. That is, uh, if you have genetically weakened skin barrier, you're going to get far more of those into your blood because your skin is not strong enough to prevent that. The protein filigrin is important for the structure and moisture balance of the skin and properties that affect the skin's ability to function as a barrier against chemicals. So the question is, well, how would I know if I have thin skin or not? Well, a dermatologist could tell you, and I believe that we should all be having regular annual skin checkups, especially on your scalp, where you're, even if you have a full head of hair, because you may have been exposed to sun early in life that caused genetic damage that is only later in life when your immune system is weaker, manifesting as some form of skin cancer. And if that's the case, the vast majority of those cancers can be burned off or frozen off uh, or easily surgically removed for the vast majority. Melanoma, that's a different story. That's a killer. And that has to be taken very seriously. So if you see any discolorations, uh, little wounds that don't heal anywhere on your body, make sure you get in to get those checked. And then have your overall skin checked. So I will take the time on an upcoming program to do a classroom on the air of how to have healthier skin, skin that is more protected, and also how to make sure that your skin is producing the kind of bacteria that protects it and that you're not overwashing all that off. And what are you doing as a natural moisturizer? Protect your skin. And also there's brand new research out of the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom that talks about breastfeeding and why breastfeed, breastfed babies have improved immune systems. And the research from the uh, Birmingham Women's and Children's um, National Health Service Foundation Trust has revealed some really important new insights into the biological mechanisms of the long-term positive health effects of breastfeeding because it's the best way in the world to naturally immunize your baby against disease because you're creating, through the breast milk, you're creating the baby's immune system. And breastfeeding, we already know you're going to have a better outcome in life and through infancy, right through adulthood. That's been, and been proven in hundreds of studies that babies receiving breast milk are less likely to develop asthma, obesity, autoimmune diseases, later in life compared to those who are exclusively formula-fed. However, up till now, the immunological mechanisms responsible for these effects have been very poorly understood. In this new study, researchers have for the first time discovered that a specific type of immune cell called a regulatory T cell expand in the first three weeks of life in breastfed human babies and are nearly twice as abundant as in formula-fed babies. And these cells also control the baby's immune response against maternal cell cells transferred with breast milk and help reduce inflammation. Remember, a, mother, a mother's body is just a miracle because when she's holding her baby, kissing the baby, her body is then producing everything that the baby needs, transferring it right back through to the baby in the breast milk. So we know that this works. Now we know the mechanisms by it work, how it works. And we know, for example, that showed a specific bacteria called Villanolia and uh, Gemellia, which support the function of regulatory T cells are more abundant in the gut of breastfed babies, meaning healthy bacteria in breast milk, healthy bacteria in the babies. This was published in the peer-reviewed journal Allergy. So all the more we should be breastfeeding. And ideally, it's not always practical, but ideally for the first two years of a child's life. No, and by the way, University of Helsinki, the status of vitamin D and A 
vegan diet significantly remodels metabolism in young children. This was published in uh, the journal EMBO, Molecular Medicine, and it shows that you are going to be healthier on a healthy plant-based vegan diet. Just make sure you're getting extra vitamin D and A because those are important. Vitamin B12 is important. But one more study showing a healthy diet in children, less disease, and a healthier adulthood. And one more thing before we take our break. This is from Deborah Davis. We've had her on this program several times. You would never know by the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN. You would never know by any agency of government that 5G has any downside that would adversely affect plants, humans, the environment. Everything is good. You see it in the commercials. Ad nauseum, the commercials, 5G, the connection of all things. And I guess these are very smart people. They have taken Edward Bernay, the father of American propaganda, and they have mastered how to target their audience. Now, it's not going to work the same on an older population that have been around long enough and are critical thinkers, but it sure does work on the kind of the mindless younger, those who are mindless, not all are by any means, but those who don't do homework, don't do research, don't understand scholarship, are intellectually deficient, deficient in many areas, intentionally so, because they just, they want something, go to Wikipedia. Well, you know, if Wikipedia were a uh, paper source of information, I would only recommend it uh, as toilet paper. Because for those of us who have done our homework, and I've done 73 articles against Wikipedia, um, you know my feelings walk away from Wikipedia. It's a biased, grossly inaccurate source of information used more now. It's been weaponized to destroy everybody who is actually a thinker and a doer and a changer in our society, from Deepak Chopra to Robert Kennedy Jr., etc., but the National Academy of Sciences, no less, our most august and respected scientific body, is now coming out saying that pulsed microwave radiation, that's your 5G, likely caused brain damage in U.S. diplomats. Hmm. So if it caused brain damage in U.S. diplomats, that means that wireless technology and those beams can also cause damage in human beings. So for parents or teachers, you appreciate that buried in all these devices are manufacturing statements that they are not to be used on the bodies of adults or that children absorb proportionally more microwave cell phone radiation. Now, according to Dr. Davis, quote, a bombshell analysis from the National Academy of Sciences added fuel, fuel to the fire, concluding that many of the distinctive and acute signs, the symptoms, and observations of puzzling permanent brain damage reported by American diplomats in Cuba and China, quote, are consistent with the effects of directed pulsed radio frequency energy microwave radiation. Of course, the devil's in the details. The extensively reviewed Academy report does not speculate on who may have directed what pulsed electromagnetic weapons against Americans and Canadian diplomats. Still, a few matters are clear. Phones and brain damage, damaging weapons can employ the same microwave frequencies. The cold reality is that the fastest growing markets for microwave radiating devices in America today are infants, toddlers, and school children. Of course, exposures from phones and tablets are not as high intensity as weapons, but that does not ensure their safety because children have immature brains and skulls and immune systems. We take certain steps to protect them from bike or car crashes. We should do the same to minimize the impact of any microwave radiation on their young, fast-growing bodies and brains. So, and I posted her article on PRN.FM so you can download the whole thing and read it for yourself. But again, we have over 10,000 scientists and physicians. We have thousands of scientific articles showing the danger of 
3G, 2G, 1G, 4G, and of course what is now going to be 5G. And we have the testimony. We have it all up there. We have a call to action. Read the articles. Read them. Watch the documentaries. And then you would say, my goodness, why didn't we know this? Censorship. Ah, yeah, we got a lot of that today. You bet we do. That's one of the reasons why those of us who are nonpartisan, I don't care who's in the White House, in my opinion, no matter who you put in the White House, they're going to look after special interest groups. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be for our interest. And all you have to do is look around if you doubt that. Again, don't listen to what they say. Everybody knows how to use language to open your heart, but then to capture your attention. Look at what they do. Just take a look. Just be honest. All right? That's the latest on health and healing. We're going to take a break, and when we come back from the break, something that we're going to do to show you what's time now for you to do. We've done the scholarship. We've done the heavy lifting. We've done thousands of hours of research. We've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of scientists and physicians. We've reviewed all the literature, and we are now at a point where we can confidently say that our entire approach to the COVID has been a mitigated disaster. It has been wrong scientifically. And we have never in my lifetime, never as an activist for over 50 years, a half a century, I've been in the trenches, never once have I seen massive amounts, legions of orthodox people, pro-vaccine, pro-medicine, pro-everything, challenging Anthony Fauci and the criminals that run these t- terrible organizations. The CDC should be disbanded and closed down and turned into a museum because it's a museum of systemic racism and hate. You wouldn't know that today, but it is. And the FDA, a complete cesspool of corruption and revolving door special interest manipulation. So we're going to play you part two today of a... Uh, of a tape we played part one yesterday. And what we're going to play for you, just so you understand, is a person who has done the homework, Dr. David Martin. Now, Martin's kind of an interesting dude. He, he is extremely well, um, well regarded in his field. He is unique in his field. And he's a professor. And he's one of those, truly one of the smartest guys in the room, people. He doesn't pretend to be. He is. They made the mistake of fighting him in his area of expertise. Wow. How stupid you should be. Clearly, none of the young millennials have read um, The Art of War, the 5th century B.C. tome that tells you some things you should do before you go into a conflict. Lo Zhu. Well, he comes back at him. By the way, all these people are coming back. They're all fighting back. They're not taking cover. And you're going to hear what he has to say. Now, listen carefully. He has a document. We've reviewed the document. We reviewed all this. We had our lawyers review it. He's giving you all the homework so you can take the document and file it with the attorney generals. Lawyers should be all over this. You as citizens should take this to your legislator. He outlines what he has believes are the corruption of Anthony Fauci and all the people associated with COVID. And he takes you in a place that you've never been. No one's been. No one ever in Congress, in the Justice Department, no one knew how to ask a person, how many patents does the, does the American public get a royalty on? Oh, this amount. Who checked it? He did. They lied. They perjured themselves. Oh, you mean we had, and you got to listen carefully what he's saying. You mean they actually, Anthony Fauci and friends, were actually working on the SARS virus and getting a patent on it and its gain of function prior to there ever being a SARS virus and a SARS outbreak? Yeah, he shows you the documentation. And Fauci tried to get a patent on an HIV, uh, HIV virus. 
drug, yeah. Yeah, and they rejected it. You're going to hear stuff. All of it is is in his dossier. And he says now, and he's right, it's up to the public to be concerned enough, at least those who are, to take this information to every every prosecutorial office in the United States until someone, because the White House is not going to do it, the Justice Department's not going to do it, because they're in bed with the corporatists. But he's, he's outlining all this. Did you know that Bloomberg and Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci all belong to a group together that patent these? We're going to come back with all this information. This is important, and no one else has this. We do. We're sharing it with you right after this break. These arguments are persuasive to the extent that an antigenic peptide stimulates immune response that may produce antibodies. The immune response produced by a vaccine must be more than merely an immune response to be protective. Here's a tiny problem. The gene therapy that's coming out of Moderna and Pfizer, the gene therapy is actually producing a toxin. The hope, and by the way, I'm going out on their limb now, the hope is that once you produce the spike protein toxin, you will somehow also produce an antibody response or an immune response to the toxin. But let's be really precisely clear. Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna and all of their collaborators are actually not injecting you with a thing to trigger immune response. They're actually injecting you with a thing to trigger a pathogen response that then is supposed to hopefully trigger your immune response. So I don't care how they do it. The patent office has schooled Anthony Fauci. This was in a beautiful rejection back um, in, in um, I don't know, it was like 2003 or four. Fauci's been schooled on this by a patent examiner, and he got it wrong. He still gets it wrong. Conspiring to fund acts of terror, we've got that chapter and verse. Whole bunch of pages on that one, people. It's actually pretty cool. Let me just read you. Let me read you uh, the the quote from our illustrious Dr. Anthony Fauci. Quote: The emergence of the new virus is going to change that figure. And the figure was how much he was getting about twenty to thirty million dollars that he was actually getting earmarked for SARS research. Um, The emergence of the new virus is going to change that figure likely considerably, Fauci said. I don't know how much it's going to be, but I think it's going to generate more sustained interest in coronavirus because it's very clear that coronaviruses can do really interesting things. End quote. That's America's doctor. Coronaviruses can do interesting things. things. That is so cool. How about 18 U.S. Code Section 2331? Subsection 802, Acts of Domestic Terrorism. Anthony Fauci, doing a great job, reporting to the president that as many as 2.2 million deaths may result from a pathogen that had not yet been isolated and could not be measured with any accuracy. Dr. Fauci intimidated and coerced the population and the government into reckless, untested, harmful acts, creating irreparable harms to lives and livelihoods. Neither the Imperial College nor the Independent, and by the way, look into these guys. I've got all the information in the dossier. Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which you think is University of Washington, but it's not. It's the long arm of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Had any evidence of success in estimating previous burdens from coronavirus, but without consultation or peer review, Dr. Fauci adopted their terrifying estimates as the basis for interventions that are explicitly against medical advice. And just for the record, in both the Imperial College study and in the IHME uh, report that estimated that 2.2 million people were going to die from this epidemic, pandemic, fear campaign, mm. which, by the way, in the wildest of wildest numbers, hasn't even been close within an order of magnitude. But let's set that aside, shall we? Let's dive into the fact that even in their models, both the Imperial College model and the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation only modeled for the quarantine of a sick population, not the house arrest of a healthy population. Fauci got it wrong, not unintentionally, not because he wanted to kind of do his best. He got it wrong to actually manipulate, coerce, and terrorize the population. Call it what it is. 
He's a liar, which brings me to 18 U.S. Code Section 1001, lying to Congress. Ooh. On October 22nd, 2020, the United States Government Accountability Office, this is the arm of the the kind of congressional interaction with government agencies, Government Accountability Office, published a report entitled Biomedical Research, NIH should publicly report more information about licensing of its intellectual property. We agree, don't we? Mm. We agree that it would be a good idea if NIH would publish more information. Because after all, having had $763 billion allocated to them, yeah. it would kind of be nice to know. What's going on? Did anybody get anything for that? You know, we. I know we have more food allergies than we did yes. in 1984. I know we have more infectious disease that seems to be spreading in our population than we had in 1984. In we definitely have more obesity. We have more chronic disease. We have more all kinds of things. And, and that's all with $763 billion allocated. So mm, I'd like to know where the money's going, wouldn't you? Well, I would too. There you go. NIAID grants or collaborations have resulted in 2,655 patents and patent applications of which... 95, you heard those numbers right, 2,655 patents and patent applications, of which only 95 include the assignment of government interest. Mm -hmm. And when Congress asked NIH and NIAID to report to them how many of their patents were making money, guess what they did? They lied. They only listed 23 of the patents that were currently involved in medical compounds and drugs, 21 on their official register, and they left out 40 of them. And they lied to Congress. And do you think anybody in Congress paid any attention? Of course not, because they're too clueless to actually independently verify a single thing. Well, good news for them. You can carry one of these reports to your congressman <laughs> or commerce, congresswoman's office, to your senator or sen senator's office or their regional office headquarters in your town, Cool thing is you can take one of these reports, drop it off for them, and say, hey, by the way, Do Dr. Anthony Fauci, Mr. Alex Amazar, Department of Health and Human Services, Bob Redfield at CDC, lied to the Congress. That's actually a crime. Many crimes in there. To lie to Congress. There's a bunch of other things that are kind of fun in this one. There's a lot of lying to Congress in here, apparently. 15 U.S. Code, Section 1, conspiring to criminal commercial activities. As early as 2000, and specifically May 21st, 2000, Dr. Ralph Barrick and the University of North Carolina sought to patent critical sections of the coronavirus family for their commercial benefit. And by the way, that turned into a patent that the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill received. Um, in one of the several papers derived from the work sponsored by the seminal grant, the one that got all this nonsense started, AI 23946-08. Um, in one of the several papers derived from the work sponsored by this grant, Dr. Barrick published what he reported to be the full-length cDNA and SARS-CoV, in which it was clearly stated that SARS-CoV was, was based on a composite of DNA segments. Quote, using a panel of contiguous cDNAs that span the entire genome, we have assembled the full cDNA of SARS-CoV Urbani strain and have rescued molecularly cloned SARS viruses, infectious clones SARS-CoV, that contain the expected marker mutations inserted into the clones. Now, what makes this particular patent application and patent interesting is the patent application claims a priority to May 21st, 2000. Hmm. SARS didn't exist until 2003. Ooh. Now, just for those of you who are out there going, hold on a minute, Dave. That you said you said May twenty first, two thousand. SARS wasn't even known. As a matter of fact, in CDC's April twenty fifth, two thousand three patent application, they make the statement that coronavirus has never been known to cause significant disease in humans. So they make that statement. CDC makes that statement. So how is it that a May twenty first patent application in two thousand actually has the complete SARS COV strain without SARS being SARS until then. And that's where you need to learn a lot about patent law because what they actually were manipulating in May 21st, 2000, they were able to twist once the SARS outbreak became a public piece of knowledge 
they were able to amend their patent application and get SARS under the camel's, kind of the camel's nose under the tent. So they actually backed SARS into a thing that they said they invented in 2000. Uh. Or, who knows, maybe they had something to do with SARS. I don't know. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying, it's who knows? Out. It's an interesting thing. The entire timeline of this interesting thing, which has to do with making a pathogenic, virulent, but non-replicative SARS coronavirus project, which actually predated the outbreak of SARS. So the amplification of coronavirus to make it more pathologic Hmm. happened before there was SARS. Anyhow, you'll get it all because it's all in this amazing dossier. How about... 15 U.S. Code Section 8, market manipulation, market allocation. How about this? Forcing the public to rely on the COVID tracking project funded by Bloomberg, Zuckerberg, and Gates Foundations. Let's stop for a minute. Every COVID number you see is actually not coming from public health authorities. Every COVID number you see is coming from the Bloomberg, Zuckerberg, and Gates Foundation project published in The Atlantic. And we all have come to know and love The Atlantic as a medical publication of public medical information. Not a public health agency. Dr. Fauci used fraudulent testing technology, the RT-PCR, which, by the way, he criticized, and also in the dossier, he criticized as not being diagnostic for coronavirus because back in 2003 and 2004, and at an official statement that he made in 2005 where he was talking about the next 10 years of coronavirus, he was promoting a DNA microchip array because RT-PCR testing wasn't good for coronavirus. Hold on a minute. So he's promoting another technology technology. that was his technology that he had paid for as a a better alternative than RT-PCR. So the cool thing is he actually said it wasn't a very good technology because it had all kinds of possibilities for all kinds of errors in various ones Mm. of the publication. So they were going to come up with different ways to do it, which he promoted in 2005 because RT-PCR kind of didn't work out so well. And then all of a sudden he's decided... It's a thing. ...that RT-PCR must work, apparently. Dr. Fauci used fraudulent testing technology, RT-PCR, to conflate COVID cases with positive PCR tests in the living while insisting that COVID deaths be counted by symptoms alone. So if you live asymptomatically with the virus, then you're a case. But if you die, we don't want to measure it because we don't want to know that you didn't die with the virus. So we want to make sure that deaths are counted by symptoms and lives that are allegedly asymptomatic are counted by tests. That makes sense in no world ever by anybody other than a person who wanted to perpetuate a market demand for his desired vaccine agenda, which was recited by him and his conspiring parties around the world until the present. What is this? 15 U.S. Code Section 19, Interlocking Directorates. Dr. Fauci on the Leadership Council of the Bill and Melinda Gates Global Vaccine Action Plan while he is running the Viral Research Center at NIAID. Two different organizations, some of which have profitability, some of which have more money than you should have if you are actually not trying to be subject to interlocking directives violations, which are felony violations of the antitrust laws. Dr. Fauci, while controlling the economic dispensation of federal research funding, Dr. Fauci has been and continues... You've been listening to Dr. David Martin, and he is one of the world's experts on patents, and and he's a professor, and he's just laid out an entire legal case against all these different people and you're seeing behind the scenes. You're seeing beyond the image of the media praising Dr. Fauci's American scientist. No, he is not and should not be viewed in such a laudatory manner. For those of us, myself included, <coughs> excuse me, for those of us who challenged Dr. Fauci in the 1980s on the war on AIDS, he made a disastrous decision to cause, I believe, hundreds of thousands of lives to be lost. And that is he put everything into a pharmaceutical antiviral model, AZT, and it was toxic. You had HIV positive, but otherwise asymptomatic and healthy individuals. Once they started taking AZT, which they were encouraged and cajoled to do, 
they started developing full-blown AIDS, and all they had to do is look at the package insert. One of the first things you see when taking AZT at 1,600 milligrams is that it will create AIDS-like symptoms. So how do you know a person's affected by AZT toxicity or HIV? You wouldn't. And uh, they wouldn't look at any other way of treating it other than the pharmaceutical way, unfortunately. The man who mismanaged the war on AIDS is mismanaging the war on COVID. And with complete complicity of those who will be benefiting by the hundreds of billions of dollars. More on that on our next program. And by the way, talking about upcoming programs, just to give you an idea of some of the heavyweights next week, uh, Professor Donald Hoffman, professor of cognitive science at University of California at Irvine, uh, he was also one of the pioneers at MIT in artificial intelligence and uh, later with Nobel laureate for the co-discovery of DNA, Helix uh, Francis uh, Crick. And so we're going to be talking with him about theories questioning objective perceptual reality, completely different approach to how we perceive life, our bodies, and medicine, the placebo effect, the nocebo effect, what your thoughts mean. That's going to be a heavy show. That's on Tuesday. Uh, then we also have uh, Professor uh, Diana Johnstone, a veteran journalist of 50 years, and who's going to be talking about how the left has betrayed the historical principles of social justice and peace. So the today proclaiming that what we're doing is anti-racist, is pro-racist, anti-fascist, is pro-fascism. Those who are not a part of the political theater, the kabuki that's occurring every day, can see this. She'll be deconstructing it. And she has been praised by Chris Hedges, John Pilger, Rick Rozoff, some of the heavyweight journalists. Also next week, the existential dilemma of preserving diversity and the identity of the individual in a world becoming increasingly homogeneous through globalization and the distortions and dangers of identity politics as a ruse for true authenticity. That's going to be Professor Russell Jacoby, a seasoned professor of history at UCLA. So, and he talks about social conformity and utopian idealism all of which we're proclaiming to be interested in today, and we're doing just the opposite. So, And uh, he's been praised by Howard Zinn, Gore Vidal, uh, Christopher Hitchens, and many others. So three heavyweights next week, plus three commentaries next week. And I just want to give you a few um, oversights. By the, oh, by the way, uh, something interesting at the CDC, finally... No, excuse me, the World Health Organization, they finally admit that the COVID-19 PCR test has, quote, a problem. You think? Yeah, it's not meant to that. And over the weekend coming up, I'm going to finish um, reviewing the two-hour interview I did with the man who invented the PCR, Kerry Mullis. I'm going to present the entire two-hour. I'm going to post it next week. And in it, you'll hear him say, this is not for the detection of viruses or viral load or should never be used to do a diagnosis. And what are we doing? We're doing it as a diagnosis. Everything that we're doing, we're doing wrong. So, in any case, uh, we have a lot coming up next week that my hope is that people will begin to see what kind of mess we're in. And the way you get out of this mess is that you begin to uh, take seriously what we're doing. Oh, and by the way, uh, this coming Monday, download the evidence ignored by the FCC in the live stream, the court hearing against the FCC. So we got a lot of lawyers in there on our side. It's the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia is hearing oral arguments this coming Monday in our case. Environmental Health Trust against the FCC and uh, it's also being filed jointly with the Children's Health Defense and numerous individual petitioners. We want to show them the dangers of 5G. Yeah, we're fighting back in court. So we'll see what comes from that, but you can live stream that also. Um, and 
For our listeners on WBI, we only have about four more minutes to go with you, but for everyone else, because of what I want to share with you, we're going to take it up to the top of the uh, hour. By the way, a new study, quote, the cheap antiparasitic drug could cut chance of COVID deaths by up to 75%. Ivermectin, you heard it here first. Dozens of studies, all positive. It's effective and it can help save lives. And it's still legal, which is good, at least for now. And uh, also, the CDC finally capitulated to, to uh, legal demands and removed the claim that vaccines vaccines do not cause autism from its website. That is a major victory. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And uh, also... The latest um, research on rats showed that the exposure to Roundup, which contains glyphosate, causes disease in their great-grandchildren. There was an article by Dr. Michael Skimner uh, from the Institute for Responsible Technology that showed that once you're exposed to Roundup chemicals, glyphosate, that there you have Monsanto, and they denied all this, but we got they've lost all the lawsuits now, thousands. Uh, yeah, you're not only poisoned, but generations to come are also poisoned. And also, did you hear about the HART, H-A-R-T, Homeland Security's massive new database? They're now going to look at facial recognition, DNA, and people's non-obvious relationships. Interesting article by Jennifer Lynch from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I just want to quote a few things here. And again, two more minutes. BI will cut out so you have your news top of the hour and we're going up the hour. Quote, so why do we know so little about it? The U.S. Department of Homeland Security is quietly building what will likely become the largest database of biometric and biographic data on citizens and foreigners in the United States. The agency's new Homeland Advanced Recognition Technology, HART, database will include multiple forms of biometrics, from face recognitions to DNA, data from questionable sources, and highly personal data on innocent people. It will be shared with federal agencies outside the Department of Homeland Security, as well as state and local law enforcement and foreign governments. And yet, we still know very little about it. The records the Department of Homeland Security plans to include in heart will chill and deter people from exercising their First Amendment protected rights to speak, assemble, and associate. Data like face recognition makes it possible to identify and track people in real time everywhere, including at lawful political protests and other gatherings. Other data the Department of Homeland Security is planning to collect, including information about people's relationship patterns and from officers' encounters with the public can be used to identify political affiliation, religious activities, and family and friendly relationships. The, the data, these data points are also frequently colored by conjecture and bias. So, everyone getting your uh, COVID test They've got your data. All the new cell phones that all you have to do is put your thumbprint on and it can lock or unlock your cell phone, they have your fingerprints. Did you notice that all the cell phones, they're taking pictures of you. All the computers, when you sit at your computer laptop, they're filming you. All of those little voice activated, or you don't even have to have a voice activation. They're just on nonstop in, uh, in a person's home, in all the rooms. They're recording everything being said and it's being shared. Now, you may be one of those people who say, well, I don't care. You know, they can know everything about me. I have nothing to be concerned about. And you should be, because there's not a single thing that you have in your life that you've communicated they're not going to know about. Where you shop, what you buy, what you eat, what you when you go to a theater, everything is electronically interconnected, and they have all that data. Oh, and by the way, from the University of East Anglia, the herd immunity may not be achievable even with high vaccine updates. Quote, the government vaccination program may not be sufficient to achieve herd immunity 
even if everyone in the United Kingdom is vaccinated, according to new research at the University of East Anglia. Researchers modeled the effectiveness of the UK-wide immunization programs using the Oxford and Pfizer vaccines, taking into account the highly transmissible new COVID variant. They found that the way to reach herd immunity for the UK would be to vaccinate almost everybody, including children, with the more effective Pfizer vaccine. They say data for the recently licensed Moderna vaccine will be similar to the Pfizer results. So first they said, oh, 40%, 50%, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. Now they're saying almost 100% of people must be vaccinated to get herd immunity. How about working on something very simple like herd immune response? Eat healthier foods, healthy juices and sugars instead of caffeinated sugar drinks. Get a good night's sleep. Stay a safe distance from cell phones and electromagnetic pulses. Use one of the cord phones where the, you have the, you have your earplugs in, but the cell phone's at least two feet away from your body. How about taking vitamin D and vitamin C and zinc and selenium so that your body is strengthening its own immune response? How about exercising at least half hour every day? Simple things, meditation and yoga. No, none of that is suggested. So when they don't suggest that which is self-evident and backed by thousands of scientific studies, and they only want you to take the vaccine, that's a problem. Especially as we've shown you, they cannot prove the actual efficacy or safety of the vaccine at this time. But we're supposed to trust them, the very people who've lied to us nonstop. We're also looking at the latest stimulus, $2.6 trillion stimulus, according to Ross Marchand from Responsible Statecraft. Quote, the $2.6 trillion stimulus was one heck of a holiday bonus to defense contractors. Quote, America's debt has more than doubled over the past 10 years, skyrocketing from $13 trillion to more than $27 trillion over just two presidential administrations, in spite of successive presidential promises to, quote, wind down conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, the defense budget has only gone in one direction, up. The dysfunctional budgeting process was so full, was on full display during the last week of 2020, with lawmakers cramming uh, over $740 billion in defense funding as part of a massive two point $3 $3 trillion spending bonanza that included $696 billion for the Pentagon and the rest for non-Department of Defense spending like the nation's nuclear weapons program under the Department of Energy and members of Congress didn't have all that much time to spend to read through the bills more than 5,500 pages. They had about four hours, by the way. I'm Gary Nall. Thank you all for listening and have a nice day.